In this lesson, we are learning about the species distribution. Here are our dot points that we need to know of subject matter. All right, so we know that organisms exist within their own niche in an ecosystem, and their fundamental niche is that ideal niche that it would occupy, given all the widest possible op opportunities to live in, right? But we also know that in reality, it needs to make compromises to live in harmony with all the other organisms in the community and manage the abiotic conditions in the environment as well. So many things will impact the distribution and abundance of the organisms within this niche. So if we're talking about distribution and abundance of an organism, we need to understand what these words actually mean. So the abundance of an organism looks at the number of individuals in that population and the distribution is uh, the way in which or the geographical location or region in which it's found and its extent within this area. So in that graph right there, it basically shows abundance and distribution. It's showing abundance based on how wide the green strip is and it's also showing distribution along a particular sampling line. So it's also important to consider the density of the population. Um, you know, are they clumped, are they uniform, are they random? But we're gonna talk a little bit more about this when we learn about population growth. All right, we know that all the environmental factors available will impact the individual organism and their population. So it makes sense for both abiotic and biotic factors to influence the distribution and abundance of a species. It's either helping it to survive or it's hindering it. So it's surviving and thriving. Right, one of these factors is a resource which the population requires, but it's in really small quantities, it can negatively affect the population. This is a limiting factor. Now, limiting factors can depend on the size of the population, and this makes them density dependent, or they can um, affect the population regardless of how many organisms are in it. So that's our density independent. Now, generally speaking, our limiting factors which are density dependent are biotic, and our density independent factors are abiotic. Here's a nice panda to help you learn that. Right, so limiting factors which are abiotic are generally our density independent. We have seen these before. They should be very familiar to you in terms of abiotic factors in an ecosystem. So um, it might be that an organism's tolerance range for sun exposure or drying out is really low. So it needs to be further down the rocky shore. So it spends most of the day in water um, rather than being exposed at low tide. Um, and tolerance ranges come into play here. So an organism can only have a very narrow range within which it can survive in changing conditions. Now there's many biotic factors which influence uh, population abundance and distribution. We also really have to consider every type of organism interaction we've talked about already. So the predation, the symbiosis, all of that. We're gonna talk more about that when we talk population change and growth. So a significant impacting force on abundance and distribution is competition. Now, competition is the presence of another organism competing for the same resource. Now, when I say resources, it might be food. It might also mean water or nutrients in the soil if you're a plant, uh, space to grow in, a nesting site, shelter, whatever, right? Now, competition can be intraspecific, so between members of the same population, or it can be between um, organisms in different uh, species, sorry. So generally, competition between different species occurs between members at the same trophic level of a food chain. So producers with producers, herbivores and herbivores, carnivores carnivores, you get the idea. In a situation where two species are trying to inhabit the same niche, okay, remembering that niche means all the interactions, the when, the where, the how, the what, the whatever of survival, the overlapping fundamental niches will eventually result in two species competing, right, competing in that overlapping section until one species is outcompeted and it retreats. So that weaker species has to make a compromise if it's been bested, essentially, and it might have to find a new source of food, a new nesting location, a new time to feed, right? This is competitive exclusion. The weaker species has been excluded from this part of the niche. Now, a classic example was demonstrated um, by a scientist named Gauss, I think that's how we pronounce it, and he grew two species of paramecium, both separately and together. He found when he placed the, them in the growth environment separately, they would both use all the available nutrients and space and survive and reproduce until they maxed out the environment, essentially. But when he put them in together, he noted that one species thrived or the other was killed off completely. 
Now, one species of paramecium, they were able to use the resources more effectively and therefore reproduce quicker. Okay, in any ecosystem, the species with the more to the more narrow tolerance range is going to be less flexible in terms of its physiological capabilities to survive. So in a slightly different environment, it will be outcompeted. So essentially we're talking survival of the fittest here, but in terms of fit, fit means adaptable and flexible. Now the experiment's since been modified and the results show that two species actually can coexist, but at least one considerable difference must be made in an organism's niche. So if the weaker species makes even the slightest compromise, it's possible for them to coexist in the same space and time. But you've got to keep in mind, these are all theoretical concepts which are really difficult to investigate experimentally. So to, to properly observe this, we need to introduce a new animal into an already stable ecosystem. Now, resource petitioning has to happen when we're making compromises over available resources. So it might be that we need to feed at a different time of day. It might be that we need to feed at a different space within the microhabitat. Um, birds do this quite, quite easily um, along the shoreline. They feed at different depths, you know, based on their bills and their legs and all those kinds of things. Ultimately, if there is less competition for the same resource and less overlapping of a niche, there's a larger number of organisms capable of living in the same habitat and that increases biodiversity, which is a good thing. So when there's more types of plant species in the same area, all those bees and stuff, you know, they have more options and they can use a wider range of species in the food chain. When biodiversity is low, however, when we have low plant species richness, they're overlapping in their niches. And we can visually represent our niches using various resources available on our axis there, okay? And the image to the right is a practice question asking you to identify species which are occupying the same niche. Right, so quite a bit of important information covered there today.